politics in it, there's obsession in it, there's romanticism in it, there's poetry in it, and there's your own personal relationship to it. It's, it's an entire world, really. There's never a dull moment with guitar culture if you're an obsessive. For some reason I had a complete fascination with this little wooden toy guitar that was in the window of this um, kind of shop that sold uh, buckets and brooms and paintbrushes and all of this stuff when I was five years of age and um, I used to just make my mother um, stop outside this, uh, this shop and like look in the window and uh, that was like my treat and um, all right well we'll go past the shop so you can see the guitar. I would <laughs> sit gazing at television in the late 60s and early 70s in the hope that the, the musical segment that would come on would be someone who was playing a, a guitar. The iconography of it, to me, is, is uh, started then, so it wasn't like seeing Jimi Hendrix or, or uh, the stuff that you get into later that is very powerful iconography. It was almost mundane. I loved it that much. Seeing uh, my first ever real guitar close up at, I want to say like nine, ten, which was a, an Irish show band who played the sort of hits of the day as well as his Irish songs and this guy had a red strat and, and open the case and let me see it. That that was that was a really really powerful moment for me. Being so close to a real actual guitar, I would just go up to it on the television. It was like treasure when I saw that guitar. Um, in my in my memory, it was didn't have a ding on it. It was absolutely pristine. It was something like Red is from the Lost Ark or something. It's an amazing artifact. So for the longest time, from as long as I can remember, having a guitar was, was my identity before I could even play it. So I have no idea where this thing came from. You know, I literally don't, I can't remember a time when I didn't love the guitar. You know, I feel like I was very fortunate growing up in the time that I did because the 60s had happened and I was very little then. Uh, but coming of age, becoming a teenager in the 70s, pre-punk and during punk was very interesting. Well, first off, at about 11, I worked in a, gu a guitar shop for free. You weren't allowed to pay me, you weren't allowed to employ me. So I would go and do it for nothing and then they'd, they'd give me uh, they give me guitar strings for it, and plectrums, and a capo, and stuff like that, for just running around getting the bosses sandwiches, and running, running around buying him his cigarettes, and all of that. The music was about to change, and I think it's right that, obviously, part of the teenage experience is that you reject what is irrelevant for, for you, and some parts of old guitar culture had become like that for me, I'd start to look at some of the adverts I was seeing and, and certainly a lot of the music that I was hearing and it just sounded like really old fashioned and really corny to me and very macho. Guitar needed to move on. I didn't think that I was gonna necessarily like pioneer it, but uh, I felt like I was riding a wave that was going somewhere it was an escape for me. It was a way that I could get out of the suburbs and get out of you know, the drudgery as of a normal job as I saw it. So I uh, made this declaration that uh, as a guitar player, 
I was going to dedicate my life to it. And um, I had a feeling that it was going to take us some places. Amazingly, that is what happened to me. say it didn't happen immediately because I had plenty of kicking around in the rain and the cold, you know, trying to find rehearsal rooms and, um, and, and paying dues, but uh, I now know that those times are really invaluable, particularly playing under other people's bands, playing other people's material, because you just learn all these different quirks about songwriting, really. It was my way out, and so there was a certain amount of desperation in it as well. It wasn't all entirely idealistic. When I was learning to play and put chords together, um, I was completely studying glam rock, uh, the music of the early 70s, pop music of the early 70s, and I still, Maintain that if you listen to uh, Can the Can by Susie Quattro, what you know, was considered complete bubblegum at the time for teeny boppers. All the young dudes mock the hoople. This town ain't big enough for the both of us by Sparks. The David Bowie stuff, the T-Rex stuff, um, the sweet blockbuster, Hellraiser, all of that. That was the stuff that I was buying and really studying as a kid and they're all built on absolutely rocking great guitars with interesting overdubs. So I was aware of the difference in textures on guitars, even before that really with Everly Brothers stuff, with what Chet Atkins was doing on, on really loud acoustics and when I did Eddie Cochran. So I'd grown up obsessively noticing the difference in guitar sounds. And then the, the next touchstone was before the Smiths formed when I kind of locked myself away with a, a very strong sort of uh, direction of uh, uh, trying to do the guitar equivalent of the Phil Spector records. I was aware that the chord changes weren't necessarily guitar chord changes. A lot of those songs were written on the piano and in weird keys. So <laughs> I thought, oh, right, Capo is going to be pretty interesting. And, try to get this sort of similar sort of sound, but I, I, I had this thing about the songwriting of, of the Brill Building and the uh, girl groups, Shangri-Las particularly in the Ronettes. How cool that would be if it was through the same equipment that the Patti Smith group used. So that was this thing I'd go in, and I had a little three-track, weirdly, cassette player, which is up on the, on the wall over there. So I, I got into making these tapes, and then, a very important aspect of what they, I then became known for when the Smiths started making records was that we were produced by John Porter. The first album was produced by John Porter and then quite a lot of the key singles. Because John taught me so much. He taught me about high string tunings, aka Nashville tunings, and he taught me about putting the guitar through Leslie's. All these different, lots of capos, tunings, all of those different things reignited or connected with that person I was when I was making these tapes where I just overdub and overdub and overdub. I still feel like that's what I'm doing now in this place. I feel like this is a, a, the logical um, extension of my bedroom really. This is what I was dreaming about when I was in my bedroom making tapes. So it's just the sort of grown up version of that. The decision to get a Ricky, it was deliberately to put me in a place where it would improve my songwriting. They are not as easy to play as some other guitars. I felt that the um, limitations of it would be, would be advantageous to my songwriting. I would have to play a certain way, which is exactly what happened. I wrote at least two songs on it straight away when I got it home. I wrote a, a riff which is I still, it's still one of my favourite riffs, which is Accept Yourself. Mostly with 
guitar players, you know, you want to emulate your hero and you want to, you think, well, this man or woman has got a great, cool looking guitar and I like their music. And then you set about trying to copy them. But I was very serious about trying to write this new kind of guitar approach that was very much built on chords and trying to have riffs within chords. Make the chords the riff. The other members of the Smiths will remember that in our early gigs when I didn't have a backup guitar, it seemed like I was breaking a string every show. So because I used to be skint, um, whenever a string broke there, I would, in, instead of the little ball, I would, I would just tie it in a knot uh, around a safety pin. And um, I don't even think the, the punk guitar players did that. I don't, I, I've, my guitars were the only guitars I ever saw that actually had safety pins involved. <laughs> it, it didn't occur to me, it just get me once. I used to tune up the whole step. Andy used to tune down a step. For some reason, I used to tune up. I, I think I just liked the sound of the guitar up there and um, didn't want to use a capo. So I was asking for it, really. Part of being such a guitar fanatic was, like a lot of people my age, you go into the guitar shops, that, and there's quite a few of them in Manchester in the late 70s every opportunity you could. So it was a couple of days a week after school and, um, and definitely religiously every Saturday. Just soaking everything up and hanging around there until they threw you out. Part of that was checking out strings, you know, and um, seriously, me and my mates would have, one of my mates was into a different, his kind of strings, and I was into my kind of strings. Not like you could afford them, as I've said, but, you know, it was all part of uh, your personality, really. Ernie Ball came out with this very eye-catching um, packaging, because I've been looking at strings from being nine, 10, 11, and then I'm 15, and it was, oh, well, okay. And, um, you know, the name sounded very, you know, you knew it was American and it had the eagle on it. And so you experiment, you know, when you've got enough money to get a packet of strings and, um, and then you stick with your brand then. I use the Ernie Ball Power Slinkies, the 11s. So I was very fortunate to put out my own signature guitar, the Jag. When I meet people who have bought my guitar, it's the first thing I tell them, you need to put 11s on and you should put power slinkies on. Because that's how I design the guitar and that's my sound and, and that, that's the right feel for it. It's still a real buzz for me that I, I've got a string endorsement with a, with a company. I must have made it, I guess. <laughs> it's, it's just a great buzz. <laughs> I have a certain kind of uh, hunger for what's going to get me where, to where I need to go. I think my passion for it has never diminished, and my sort of curiosity, I think, has never diminished. I think it's very important. You know, it's been a habit of a lifetime, really, following that. I need, I need to do that. I need to do it. It's a little like someone who constantly needs to learn a new language. I'll probably never ever change now. It's too late to change. I'm glad that I've still got all of that. Yeah, and I'd, I'd always have it whether it was my livelihood or not, really. Uh, I made the decision, a conscious decision, when success came for me, uh, 18, 19, with the Smiths, that um, if playing the guitar ever got to be a chore, or fame, or stuff that came along with uh, success, ever got in the way of my love of the guitar, I would stop doing it and honour 
being a guitar player because that was my first love really and I thought that that's always got to be protected at all times. It's not about being famous, it never was. Mm -hmm.